Hi, I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mujica. I'm a professor of chemistry, School of Molecular Sciences. And I'm Bill Pateski. I'm professor of the School of Molecular Sciences, and I oversee the Advanced Materials Initiatives. So guys, we're all at ASU, been at ASU for a while, mm -hmm. and how many times has all of us taught thermodynamics? We've never all three taught together, but binary. In pairs, yeah. I think we've hit almost every one. I've taught with you, yep. 541 Advanced right. Thermodynamics. You guys have taught 541, 541 together. Mm -hmm. And Vladi and I have now been teaching this semester biological thermodynamics, 341 BCH for biochemists, and you're teaching Chem 341. That's right. Is, is it still mainly thermodynamics for chemists? It's basically thermodynamics for engineers and chemists, you know, in the Bachelor's of Arts programs, mostly. And uh, there are a number of other professions, uh, students from other professions, such as nursing. We have a number of students there too as well. So, so. And I would start this, it, this is meant to just be kind of a general discussion since we all teach uh, this topic of, of potentially just in our own opinions describing, you know, why is it we can so easily find at a university, you know, three professors who have spent a fair amount of time teaching thermodynamics and from a lot of different angles. In the School of Molecular Sciences, we cover um, you know, kind of both the biological side of sciences and the chemical side of sciences. And, you know, in physical chemistry, then we pull in physics as well. And we pull in the fundamental physics in thermodynamics to describe both biochemistry systems and chemical systems, mm -hmm. materials systems. I mean, thermodynamics is really pervasive across most fields in science as a fundamental theory that really is required for students to learn if they really want to understand some fundamentals at the molecular or even macroscopic level yeah. of any science or technology. Well, as a formal area of study, it really started out in the early 1800s with the steam engine in, yeah. in mechanical systems. You yeah, know. you almost can't distinguish the industrial revolution from the thermodynamics. That's right. And then, uh, but later on, uh, we started introducing the molecular theories that uh, we could start connecting with the thermodynamics. And so it was one of those early studies where you could uh, take molecular theory, uh, uh, but understand it from a phenomenological point of view and make that connection. Yeah. And it became a very useful way, predictive tool, really, when you have enough information for it. It was all developed, right? It was a very advanced field even before the molecular part mm, came, before yeah. Boltzmann well, and even molecular <clears throat> statistical mechanics yeah. came about, it was already a very well understood yeah. field that really resonated with experimentalists because it really gave them a, a, a theory they could use to build real technology, real right. engines, real uh, figure out real efficiencies. I mean, really interact with the real well, world. You, you, might, you might even say, I mean, the understanding the connection, which is a, a fundamental thermodynamic problem, understanding the connection between heat and work and thinking of them as uh, two ways of uh, you know, energy. Yeah. This took almost 200 years or more. Well, and, and uh, just this simple uh, fact. Because before thermodynamics, you would say it's not that people hadn't thought about energy. They almost, you know, no. from the time of Newton or even way before they yeah. have, but it was almost potential and kinetic. It was yeah. almost always how you would frame energy mm -hmm. before thermodynamics came about. Yeah. yeah, and probably, you know, steam engines. Uh, engineers were responsible for the first substantial engineers and mathematicians. Yeah. No, no physicist. Carnot, Sadi Carnot, he was an engineer. Yeah, Gibbs and, was a mathematician. And, right, yeah. and uh, he, he probably came up with the, with the very first analysis where the idea of entropy started, you know, popping up because he actually proved that there was a cycle where Q over G, that is the, Q, the key quantity yeah, the heat. for thermodynamics, the heat over temperature over a cycle, you got a zero for that quantity. And so that meant that that quantity to that quantity corresponded that uh, state function, which nobody had thought of just because of that, I mean, playing with that particular cycle. Yeah. 
And it's not clear even this day from the historical point of view, how much Carnot knew about the, the mathematical structure be, behind that finding. But it, but it was, it was impressive that they came up with this idea almost by accident. Well, this is a case where people understood the math before they really had a physical feel for what it really meant. And, and uh, something I always challenge my students about is when they first hear about uh, entropy, they, they sort of recoil from the idea, mainly because it's a strange concept. But then I ask them, well, what is energy? Tell me what is energy. Yeah. And, uh, and, and there's almost a circular reasoning going on in there is that uh, energy is the potential to do work. And then, but when you ask what work is, well, work is the ex expending of energy. And so it's almost a circular argument. And so what we really understand is pressure, volume, temperature, and all the parameters that we have uh, physical connections with. And then through that, we start getting these ideas, what energy is, what entropy is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I often say that when I'm teaching thermodynamics uh, along your lines, like it's one of the things that I almost always start off with. When I say thermodynamics, I don't just stay one of the obvious, like we're going to, you know, break down the name. It's, it's looking at heat, thermo, you know, dynamics. But I always just say, like, this is a course about energy. Mm -hmm. Everything we're looking at is energy, and we're just going to look at it from a lot of different perspectives. What is enthalpy? It's just energy. You know, what is Gibbs free energy? They give it in the name for you, so you kind of know. But I mean, we're just going to look at energy from a lot of different perspectives, whichever perspective we need to make it more tractable of a mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you were mentioned, I mean, thermodynamics is such a powerful idea and technique that even in the realm of uh, uh, relativity, I mean, cosmology, how do we think of thermodynamics there? The moment we start putting together time and space, the many of the concepts that we use in thermodynamics, even time-dependent thermodynamics, cease to apply that way. The moment we start thinking of energy, putting into account, the, taking into account the possibility that, that you can transform mass into energy, now you have another problem that this is not in the in the type of equations we write. Right. We never take that into account in chemistry. That's never the case. But it turns out that when you're talking about stars, this is the fundamental thing that you are transforming. Yeah. A, you know, light or cosmological whatever. thermodynamics it's, is huge. You know, I, I was just telling you, like, uh, because we were talking about books, and and you got me. You know, entropy. The other thing you and I have discussed before is one of the things I love, it, it's one, it's the fundamental thing they're really getting out of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the core of core, and you mentioned it earlier, like what you like about Callan's book is, is how it approaches entropy. What you like, um, you know, is, is looking at entropy. I, you know, have the same thing in what I would call a more, the more, uh, another modern. So not only looking at it from a industrial revolution standpoint where they first looked at this, then years later looking at it from a molecular standpoint like Boltzmann, but also, I mean, you can keep going, you know, looking at it from an informational Information. standpoint yeah. like mm -hmm. Shannon did. And that has, you know, become incredibly important nowadays, cosmologically, how Beckstein and others, you know, started looking at you know that, and it led to and, a lot of how, talking. Well, how information, yeah. and how information is stored. Yeah, right. which is what I was, uh, when we were going through, I had never really delved into the kind of cosmological thermodynamics until you uh, made reference to a book you like so much, yeah. Stellar Structure. Yeah, gender, uh, well, well, let's let's talk about what we, th what we each view as entropy. Uh, if you put it in words, what, how do you view entropy? What is it? It's uh, the, I, I think that the, the, the most uh, compact way to say it is that it has to do with information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Information is probably the most general concept behind entropy. Uh, whatever, whatever you do I like that transforms say, entropy, yeah. about, uh, information about a system, either. So you're generalizing plus, energy as information. So. Yes. Yeah. To, to, to some extent, yes. But, but you see, okay, so if you are, if you are talking about situations where energy is conserved, I mean, if we don't take into account uh, the possibility of particles being transformed into, into light, whereas you, you, put, you have to, to take into account something else. Yes, you can, you can think of this transformation as essentially you are measuring 
information, how information is stored, transformed, changed, and then you realize that heat can be associated with that, how energy is spread well, in molecular modes can be transformed. Maxwell's like demon wouldn't have ever gotten, that paradox right. would have never got resolved. I mean, how, how long did it take to get resolved? It's only after information theory that people could really understand mm -hmm. Maxwell's demon. Right? You know, I mean, when I, when I first describe entropy to students, you know, I, the simplest terms I can come up with, it's, it's two things. One is it's a measure of the distribution of mass in space. And then it is the distribution of energy among all the different kinds of energy levels in which energy can occupy. And mostly I'm talking about equilibrium thermodynamics when I'm talking about that. But now when you're expanding it to information, how are we making those connections with that, those kinds of fundamental physical descriptions? Well, I guess for me, you know, one of the things I love about, you know, what Shannon originally did, and, and in fact, my favorite, uh, you uh, got me into kind of the cosmological thermodynamics, but one of the things that really made an impact on me is uh, Leon Brion uh, wrote a book uh, called, you know, uh, The Science of Information Theory mm -hmm. um, uh, that really takes all of those classic problems that we usually learn in statistical thermodynamics, breaking down the Boltzmann equation into the natural log of configurations. And now you just look at, because of how quantum mechanics is set up, that everything is probabilistic, it naturally makes it into, I mean, that is what Shannon said, is it's just the log of the probability of things happening. Mm -hmm. So there's such a you know, a very intuitive one-to-one -one connection right. between what Boltzmann did and what Shannon <clears throat> And And there is another thing about information that it's uh, really fascinating that when you take that into account, I mean, the thermodynamic limit, we are, we, are, we are very much used to think of a thermodynamic system as having a large number of particles in the, in the volume so that you, you go to the thermodynamic limit uh, and divided by B, uh, going to a limit. But when you took into account information theory, you can actually think of information in one particle. When you, 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 when you do DFT, when you, when you do the density functional theory of electronic structure of matter, you can actually define entropy for one electron in the context of a many electron system. And, and it's properly defined mathematically. And it is because of this connection to, to information that you can actually get away with this type of uh, extensions of the concept to things that you wouldn't initially think right. that where, where this concept was a problem. But it is true that if you're talking about the thermodynamic, mm -hmm. the equilibrium entropy, mm, you don't really need it. You can, you can get away with many other uh, ways of thinking, uh, about, yeah, of, of, of thinking about entropy and, uh, and the existence. Because another wonder is how come that in thermodynamics, you have a universal integrating factor for entropy. It's one over T, no matter the system. The system can be butter, an ideal gas, whatever. Right. And then the, the integrating factor is one over T. You might have thought, that, okay, so we have an integrating factor, but it is system dependent. But it's not system dependent. It's reservoir dependent. It's dependent on the environment. But, you know, then how do you define temperature, though? I mean, if you would, how, what is the temperature of uh, an inverted system, such as a lazy system and that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in, in that case, would be the best you can do, I think, is to, to stop thinking of temperature as a global quantity. I mean, right. if, if, if you have non-equilibrium system, like a spin system, yeah. you can, you can well, this, you this see all the time, they call, so, they call okay, it but, but precisely. spin temperature. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, can, you can talk about the, the temperature of the spin system oh, yeah. because it, it, the excitation resides in that system for a long enough time, so you can think of it as... Or, uh, but then we start introducing new concepts because temperature, I mean, you look at a plasma and you have two different temperatures. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Basically, you've got electron temperatures and the electrons behave almost differently, separated from the, the ions and the atoms that are still in the gases. And so, um, and they have their own kind of a temperature. So the, their the definitions become a little bit trickier. What I was curious about is that you guys started talking about uh, this book that was describing the entropy of the universe 
in the context of black holes. Yeah. And there's quite a few really good books on cosmo yeah, yeah, cosmological it's a, thermodynamics. It's a, it's a, and so it's a, what, what is the energy distribution or the mass distribution, or if there is one, well, of a the, black hole? Well, the, 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 the thing is that the, the moment you understand a, a black hole as a, as a singularity in space time, then you realize that this singularity is also associated with essentially an infinite gravitational field. Mm -hmm. So the moment you understand that, you realize that you are concentrating information there, information that in principle cannot escape the system, which is not exactly true, because then they came up with this idea that black holes can actually evaporate. Yeah, the because Hawking radiation. Hawking's, Hawking yeah, radiation, right. which was thought to be impossible. But it turns out that there is an uncertainty principle that holds there and allows information to get and, and you know, the, the black hole evaporate. But you can actually define entropy. It's based on information. It's the type of information that you keep concentrating in this singularity. Mm -hmm. And this- and it, causes the it, causes, it causes the area. Exactly. It causes the area. You, you in a, I think of it as you, you can distribute information across the area of the black hole. Yeah, but but then we are to, we are we are talking about matter densities. You know, you will have to reduce the Earth to about this size. But, but, but what I to, think is fascinating be, here <laughs> is one centimeter. Is that entropy? Look how far off we can yeah. go. We can we can start heading towards the vastness of the entire universe in physics. We can talk about computers and you know just fundamental information in computers. We can be talking about chemical systems, us biological, and we're all still talking of the importance of entropy. Right. Um, you know, you brought up another point that intrigued me is that in material sciences, you know, thermodynamics is not very useful unless you've got an interface in which uh, you're examining uh, uh, the, the properties of a substance and with something outside of that substance, you know, so the system surroundings concept kind of idea. And unless you have that interface, it's almost meaningless um, that you, uh, how do you define something? And here you're talking, and, and so this is the case of like, for instance, how gases interact with uh, oxides at high temperature, for instance, solid oxides. You need to have, you need to know the oxygen partial pressure, you need to know the temperature. Right. And then that tells you, and the re response of the solid at those, under those conditions, you know, you look at it, and then that tells you something about the thermodynamics of the system. Here you're doing the same thing with a uh, black hole is that the way you're interpreting the properties and the behavior of a black hole is uh, this emission of, or the evaporation, I guess you were talking yeah. about, of, of particles or maybe some sort of energy uh, that describes the black hole. And thermodynamics would be meaningless unless you have actual interfaces between something and something. So, yeah, that, that's true. And uh, it's not only for solid, I mean, it's not just a comparison than solid and a black hole. In between, we have all the thermodynamics of small systems, which is a, a subject by itself. Hill's book. Because, yeah, Hill's book. Hill's book. Small system and at, at the time, it was just an academic exercise because really nobody had measured yeah. anything. Until nano, we, we nano, nano chemistry nano came around. Until yeah. you could control nanosystems. Mm -hmm. na gold nanoparticles or whatever nanoparticles. So that, now that you have size-dependent thermodynamics. And the thing is that everything we teach our students about energy being additive for thermodynamic subsystems or entropy being additive is not true anymore. Because now you the, the, the surface terms are so important mm. that well, this you is cannot a, disregard them. A colleague of ours to, has worked on extensively, uh, Ralph Chamberlain, yeah. physics yeah. and others have worked on mm. a lot thinking about these problems. Yeah. And, um, and, and it comes up in computation all the time where they play these tricks you know, of uh, when they're looking at the entropy, how they sum up all the entropy terms and, and stuff like this comes up in practical computation. All the well, time. I, absolutely. And, and you, you mentioned Chamberlain. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is a real problem. Try to understand why fluctuations that should be there for nanosystems, they get averaged out. I mean, the, the, the whole thing about thermodynamics of a small system is, is fascinating because in some cases, you have huge fluctuations, and in some of the cases, these fluctuations are averaged out. And the, the subject of fluctuations 
We don't, time we, don't, we don't teach that. Saying, so. we, we rarely yeah. get we, the we fluctuation the dissipation fluctuation. theorems yeah. and, but and stuff it like turns that, out, which in materials ends up being so important to yeah. nucleation mm -hmm. and, and everything else. But yeah. in fact, that's what I would say is one of the hardest things about thermodynamics is, is that there's now richness from so many different ways to cover it. You know, what do you cover nowadays? At both the undergraduate level, at the graduate level, you have such a, a rich you know, places you could pull, you know, metaphors and, and, and stuff from like, you know, it's really half of our job is just about coming up with the ones that we think are going to make the most practical impact for students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that turns. Well, yeah. I mean, take a look at our, our experiences, though. I mean, I come from a background of, you know, chemical thermodynamics of materials, which is really phenomenologically based, you know, a little bit of stat mech, but you, you're probably more of the stat mech kind of person because your background in NMR. In, yeah, yeah. In, other I, kind of... I, in fact, uh, uh, a, a guy named Goldman wrote, you know, um, a book called Spin Temperature and Magnetic Resonance. Like yeah. I come from, a, like, like you said, almost like an icing model type, you know, like where you think of it. And that's why, you know, I gravitated to a lot of this information way of looking at entropy as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. And, and then, then Vladi, your, your background, the way you came about uh, thermodynamics. Yeah, how did you come about? Yeah, it? I don't know how you <laughs> came about it. <laughs> well, I am a theoretician, and I mean, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics is uh, it's, uh, it's such a fascinating subject that uh, you cannot do theory without getting involved into this. Mm -hmm. But it is true at at some point we were very much interested in this information theory approach because it turns out that you can do most of the statistical mechanics that we take, I mean, there is this Liouville equation in, in, in quantum statistical yeah, mechanics and yeah. in classical statistical mechanics, but it turns out that you can do almost everything playing with information theory. So you don't have the real evolution of the system, but you have equations that come out of considering information, but by the information is, is not a, is not a physical variable as such. So the physical variables is well wave function in quantum or or, or momenta and position. So information is a derived is a, a quantity that you have to. But but it turns out that it's such a powerful concept that that you can get away with even describing the evolution of the system. So that's why I became so much interested in. Well, you would say. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know the more that I see kind of on the forefront of theoretical physics is. You know, oftentimes when we're in chemistry or physics, you know, we often ask ourselves, like, let's get to the fundamentals. Is mass fundamental? Is, you know, is angular momentum fundamental? Is this what is fundamental? And, and you start breaking a lot of these things down. I mean, we often love to come and stop at something like mass, you know, and then you start, you know, the physicists get involved and you realize is the mass of, you know, what we're all used to in chemistry. Okay, all the mass is in the nucleus. Well, is it, you know, yeah. neutrons and protons? Well, no. Mm -hmm. Is it really in the quarks? No, it's really in the gluon fields. You know, it's really, when you really find out that a lot of what we take of as fundamental isn't really such. And, and it seems like there's more and more convergence to information being one of the most fundamental um, it, it, you know, yeah. things to I, first define. I, I agree, but at the same time, I think it's always wise to, to keep an open mind about this because let's take biological system. We all talk about biological system. An example that I like a lot is we think of biological systems as being extremely complicated and in some cases quantum mechanics, I mean, biologists, they, they don't learn much quantum mechanics because they think, I mean, biological systems are too complicated for that. Now, They're macro out, systems, what do you need to know about out, the micro? Science, Science Magazine, there was a, a, an article saying that probably 85% of cases of cancer, they were determined by stochastic random phenomena. And then you say, what? It, so it doesn't have anything to do with what I eat, with the way I live? No, it has to do with a, with a mutation. I'm going to go get it. It's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a mutation, and a mutation is a quantum event. Now, well, quantum now, biology as a whole is it's becoming a, it's a, a huge field. Yes, yeah. It's a huge field now, and, and how all these concepts that we thought were, were not applicable to, to biological systems, they're coming back. And, you know, we have coherence, 
without coherence in biological system was completely useless because the, the, the systems are so complicated. Yeah. It turns out that coherence is extremely important to understand, for instance, photosynthesis. Or quantum mutations are very important to understand cancer. Of course, once the mutation occurs, it, it matters a lot what you eat and what you do. This, but this is another thing. But the, in the initial event, you can't do you, you can't do anything to prevent it because it happens by the rules of quantum mechanics and you have no control at all. Is it that. truly the case, though? If you look in material science, say nucleation and growth, um, and you have, uh, if you super cool a substance, a liquid, for right. instance, in nucleation, there's always attempts of growing a stable nucleus, and but uh, sometimes they're too small to be viable, so they dissolve or melt back into the solution. So things are constantly going forward and backward until there's that magic threshold that they pass, and then something happens. Well, yeah. I like that. Is that a, but is that but a then, quantum but, event? No, or but is that, but that's, a, that's a beautiful example. In that case, it will not be because this is the statistical fluctuation. The, but remember that okay. quantum mechanics has, it's a statistical in two different ways. You take average, the level of the wave function, that one is the, the fundamental physics is random in nature. And then you take a second average, which is the one you are talking about, and, and that give, uh, we give rise to all these statistical fluctuations. So mm -hmm. you need both of them. And yeah. in many cases, the quantum part is not important at all. Yeah. And I like to mention in your example here that, again, at ASU, you know, people like Austin Angel, you know, and others have made huge contributions, time temperature transformation for being able to look at in real materials, mm -hmm. nucleation yeah. versus growth, you, your group and others like, and, and a lot of these things, that's what's beautiful about this topic is you can get into the lab and really, you know, do measurements, do things to look at these mm -hmm. nucleation versus growth, watch things actually change, you know, um, which makes, you know, the, the theory come to life a lot more. Yeah. You know? um, so, well, I, we've already taken a fair amount of time. I really enjoyed yeah, this yeah, was a brief yeah, discussion, and yeah. I, I hope. But, but serendipity is that uh, the, a good way a good way to describe this encounter, sort of. Yeah, well, you know, we happen to all when three thermodynamicists happen to run into each other. What happens know? when three thermodynamicists get together? Okay, yeah, so, so. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we might have to say, oh, all right, so. For yeah. a three body event. Yeah, we might have to. That's all right. Yes, all right. You can barely, theorists can barely describe two. Don't, 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 don't <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank sure. You.